Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Helen Ann Curry about the history of seed banks. Seed banks are collections of seeds that researchers use to protect valuable genetic resources, both for breeding and conservational purposes. But where did they get started, and how have they become what they are today? On this episode, Helen will guide us through the history of seed banks, including their origins, the various phases of their development, and their ongoing role today. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but before we dive in, we wanted to thank our sponsor, Campbell Scientific. Campbell Scientific offers environmental measurement solutions that advance science and technology by providing digital sensors that measure the small and often indiscernible daily changes occurring in our world. Their products provide data to scientists and operational weather networks to help them develop insights and solutions to sustain and improve life on Earth for each of us. Please visit their website at www.campbellsci.com to learn more. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, we have Helen Ann Curry with us. Helen is a senior lecturer in the history of modern science and technology at the University of Cambridge. Her research and teaching focus on how recent developments in science and technology shapes the food we eat and the ways we farm. In recent years, she's written about plant biotechnology, international agricultural aid programs, and the conservation of crop diversity. She's the author of two books, Evolution Made to Order, Plant Breeding and Technological Innovation in 20th Century America, published in 2016, and Endangered Maze, Industrial Agriculture and the Crisis of Extinction, forthcoming from University of California Press. Hi, Helen. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm great. Thank you. It's really good to be here. Great. We are so happy to have you here and talking about a topic that I am really interested in. Uh, This has actually been on my podcast wish list for a long time, uh, and that is, of course, seed banks. So can you give us a general overview of seed banks, kind of what they are, uh, how they got started, anything like that? Sure, absolutely. I'll, I'll do my best to give you a, a quick whirlwind tour of, of seed banking today and maybe get started a little bit thinking about their history. So when people talk about seed banks, or you might also hear them refer to gene banks, what they're talking about are institutions that collect and then store seeds, or sometimes other different kinds of plant material, but often seeds, and they store those Uh, as a resource for scientists or for plant breeders to use, especially in developing uh, different kinds of crops. But but really, they're institutions that serve as as warehouses of uh, diversity in in often crop plants, but sometimes uh, other kinds of, um, yeah, other kinds of plants, uh, wild plants or, or other endangered species. So, Estimates are that around the world today, there are something like um, 1,700 seed banks. Uh, they range from, from fairly local and small scale to absolutely international and massive collections of seeds. And these really work to make sure that what crop diversity or what plant diversity we have in the world today um, we are able to keep alive uh, and keep going for the future. So they're really, um, in a fundamental way, kind of conservation institutions. Uh, though that said, they also serve as kind of day-to-day resources for many different kinds of scientists, um, and at the very localist level, often as, as resources for, for farmers or gardeners. Sure. And uh, we, we've talked about these a little bit on the show before, um, for specific crops here and there. Um, but can you tell me more about like, what does it look like if you go into a seed bank? Because I, being who I am, <laughs> uh, tend to like immediately go the sci-fi route and I'm like, oh, they're all like cryogenically frozen and, you know, <laughs> or like what I, some like weird massive institution thing. But I know they can kind of... Uh, obviously be more and different than that, depending on which one you go to. Um, But can you just describe, like, how are they actually keeping these seeds or materials? Because I know that it's uh, handled in lots of different ways. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you're, you're um, right to even be pointing out that it looks different in different places. So let me, I can answer this, I think, best by telling you about a few different seed banks that I've been into or, or ones that I've read about. So one that I haven't been to, um, but which I think is the seed bank that most people um, might have in their imagination because of its appearance in the news um, uh, more often than other seed banks, is the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. So that's a seed bank, a seed storage facility that's dug into um, the, the Arctic permafrost on the island of Spitsbergen. And so entering that seed bank is uh, walking down a long uh, concrete corridor. Uh, you can actually look, look at videos of this online if you want to. And uh, arriving at the end in a, in a great open space where boxes and boxes of seeds are stored, contributed by different countries that have their seeds stored there as a kind of ultimate fail-safe in, some, in case something goes wrong at a a national or regional seed bank that's much more accessible. So that might actually sort of fit best with your sci-fi imagination of what a seed bank is like. Um, but they're not all uh, necessarily, uh, 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 you know, kind of formed and constructed that way. So um, another quite large and, and actually old seed bank is um, one that was established in the United States in the late 1950s as the U.S. National Seed Storage Laboratory. Has a has a different name today, but uh, when it was built as the as the U.S. National Seed Storage Laboratory, uh, it was a couple of refrigerated rooms and then um, other kind of cool and controlled laboratory spaces around it. Uh, and so, I mean, I guess that that points out that at its most basic level, a seed bank is often a refrigerator um, uh, that's housed within uh, an agricultural or or another kind of research facility, um, and that might be a kind of typical form for a seed bank of normal use and, and moderate size, but there are also community seed banks, um, and these take a number of different forms. Um, I went a few years ago to visit a very famous community seed bank uh, at the Nabdanya farm in uh, India, and there the seed bank is a, a cool, dry room that's set aside, that's lined with jars, but not necessarily temperature controlled other than through through passive temperature controls, uh, like being in a shady spot. Um, so that's a seed bank that you don't need to put on a heavy winter jacket in order to walk into, but still does an excellent job of keeping seeds safe and secure from, from season to season. So hopefully that gives you a, a sense of the range of different kinds of seed banks that there are. And, and obviously there are different permutations on all of those uh, examples I've just given. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's part of what draws me to them is, I mean, not only like the sci-fi aspect, because <laughs> I'm a big nerd, uh, well-established fact of the show, um, but also I just think like all of the different ways that people go about um, protecting these seeds and keeping them uh, safely stored or like when they have to kind of regrow them uh, to make more seeds, <laughs> like all of that stuff just really fascinates me. But uh, we've got a ton of ground to cover today uh, because you are just full of knowledge about this subject. So I'm going to move us forward. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, is actually their history. And I know that you had identified um, kind of several different stages of their development. So can you just walk us through uh, each of these different phases of the history of seed banks? Yeah, that's, um, I'd be really happy to. I think for me, really, the history of seed banks and thinking about how they got started, um, we can, we can think of a long history of seed keeping, right? People have always stored seed for the future. Um, but I think there's a really interesting question of when people start thinking it's important to save seed for the future because it might disappear from, from cultivation. Um, and, and, that uh, was an idea that really uh, started to coalesce, especially in the 1890s, so more than 100 years ago in uh, Western Europe. As uh, breeders got better and better at um, controlling the heredity of plants, so they were uh, crafting more deliberately new varieties of crops. And as they distributed those new varieties to farmers, and farmers transitioned from local varieties that they'd been growing maybe for generations or that had adapted to the local environment, 
um, those older varieties, you know, they were being cultivated less, um, and the new varieties were being cultivated more. And uh, breeders and other scientists started to worry that maybe those older varieties were going to disappear forever because no one was saving the seed from from season to season. And that seemed like a problem because those seeds might have valuable traits, those varieties might have valuable traits that they as breeders might find useful sometime down the road for, for breeding back into the varieties that they were hoping to create for farmers. So all this is to say is, is they got worried about losing a resource for their work. And it's as a result of, of that worry that you see these initial calls in the, the 1890s and later for uh, countries to uh, be assembling collections of crop varieties, um, specifically with a focus on what are known as land races, on, on, on locally adapted varieties, um, and, and a little bit later on crop wild relatives, um, things that wouldn't necessarily be perceived as the most productive in cultivation, but could nonetheless be really valuable in agricultural development moving forward. Um, now, those initial early calls, although you see them repeated at regular intervals, you know, well into the 1930s, they didn't really mobilize action either um, on the, the kind of part of international organizations and, and not even really national um, initiatives, at least from the perspective of um, having this kind of conservation mission in mind. Uh, that aside, uh, there is a significant uptick in um, the collections that are assembled by national agricultural institutions for the purposes of immediate crop development, right? So not necessarily collections that are thought of as, oh, I'm banking this seed to um, make sure that 100 years from now we still have it. More collections made with the idea of we're going to collect all this seed because we want to use it tomorrow or we want to use it in 10 years, um, right? In the, a sort of nearer term vision um, of, of collections use and importance. And um, so, you know, uh, quite big collections of, of crop diversity for the use of breeders um, are, are developed in Germany, uh, in Great Britain, uh, in the United States. Um, in all of those cases associated with uh, the expansion um, of, of agriculture, either um, across empires or in the United States, the, the expansion of settler colonial agriculture, um, but the most famous uh, example of these early collections, and one that um, was informed especially not just by um, changing ideas about heredity and improvement in breeding practices, but ideas about the, the, the origin of, of um, crop plants and their spread of diversity around the world, was a collection in Russia, um, a, a collection that became the central uh, breeding resource of uh, Soviet uh, breeders in the, the early and mid 20th century. Uh, and this was orchestrated by a scientist named Nikolai Vavilov, who's probably the most important early champion of collections of crop diversity uh, that we have. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and we are actually uh, just a, a pitch for next episode. We will be uh, discussing Vavilov. Uh, in greater depth on our very next episode. Um, yeah, because he did a lot uh, for early seed banks and also um, the other scientists he worked with who uh, kind of had, some of them had a, a pretty tragic end, actually. Um, I don't know if you want to touch on that at all. Um, or uh, we can kind of move on to the next uh, phase, I suppose. Yeah, I think I'll leave the specific history to, of Nikolai Vavilov and of the um, All Lenin Institute um, to the to the real experts on that history. Um, I'm happy to to talk about how um, this era of building um, big state collections of crop diversity, mostly for um, more immediate uh, agricultural development. Um, eventually became a project of international collaboration in, in conservation. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Great. So I'll just dive in there. I think for me, when I um, was researching this history, I think 
a moment that really jumped out as an important um, kind of moment of transition in terms of of uh, breeders thinking much more internationally and much more urgently about about conservation and the possibility of of disappearance and extinction of varieties um, as opposed to simply amassing resources. Um, came really in the in the 1940s um, and the early 1950s, and um, I'm from the United States, and I'm an American historian by training. So, um, so this is a context that I know well, and that might inform me seeing this as a or this jumping out at me as a as a particularly pivotal moment. But um, a group of maize scientists, so uh, biologists working with corn as their chief, you know, research subject. Um, became really agitated in the late 1940s that um, maize varieties from across the Western Hemisphere were, um, as they described it, disappearing, that they were on, en route to inevitable extinction. Um, and so this was in many ways a repetition of this, uh, this declaration about the loss of land races that I mentioned had been going on for a long time. Um, only now it was starting to be described by these scientists and others as 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 much more kind of globally sweeping, right? That this was farmers around the world were tradi- uh, transitioning to commercial varieties, and um, the the face of agriculture was changing so rapidly that um, there really would be there would be no going back, and and that many more varieties than ever before were in danger of of being lost. So these maize biologists saw um, um, or thought they saw agricultural transitions about to sweep the Americas and that uh, maize, which is, uh, you know, originates in Mexico uh, historically and, and has its greatest diversity in Mexico and, and other parts of uh, Latin America, um, this tremendously uh, rich diversity in a species that was also uh, central to U.S. American agricultural production um, was potentially uh, on its way uh, out the door. And so these uh, U.S. biologists organized um, what was called the Committee on Preservation of Indigenous Strains of Maize, and they got resources from the U.S. Foreign Aid Office uh, in the early 1950s to go about, uh, as, as systematically as they could, collecting um, land races of maize from um, various parts of the Americas, from, from Chile to uh, Canada. Uh, and they organized for those uh, maize varieties, for all of that different diversity, to be stored in um, principally three uh, what they called seed storage centers, um, in part because this language of, of seed bank hadn't come around yet. Um, but they set up three seed storage centers uh, in Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia. And they also sent some seeds uh, to the United States, which we can come back to. Um, but it was really important that they set up those um, seed storage centers in the countries that I've named because they recognized that the maize that they were collecting, uh, much of it wouldn't be able to be grown out in the United States. And the seed needed to be renewed at regular intervals um, in order to be in order for the collection to be refreshed um, when seeds were at the end of their lifespan, for example, and therefore kind of kept in perpetuity. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I think this um, uh, this particular moment is important in the history of seed banks, because uh, you see these scientists grappling with how exactly they were going to ensure maintenance and perpetuity. Um, they uh, had refrigerated chambers ordered, but despite that, they thought that the seeds would need to be grown out and new seed collected um, still every few years. Uh, so this was like a, a major operation to contemplate. Um, and I think uh, the the struggles that they had to even conceptualize what it would mean to, to, to save seed in perpetuity in an institution uh, in this way uh, really shows just how new an idea it was in some ways. Sure. Is this um, is this group of scientists the kind of center of your new book that's coming out? They're one moment in this history. Uh, they are in some ways the way that I, I got into the story in the first place. Um, but the the kind of important role that they um, play is um, as a mm, almost a kind of 
a manifestation of an early effort to organize a kind of international operation. So they, you know, they ended up collaborating with scientists across um, Central and South America, also with scientists in Mexico, uh, in order to put these collections together and then try and, and, and create safe storage spaces for them. Um, and, uh, and that project of kind of orchestrating international collections, uh, um, making sure that procedures were agreed for how to keep them, uh, successfully, that then became a much more global international project, uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Yeah. Can I just, I just want to come back to, because I didn't, I didn't kind of close the loop on the, the maze transition. I think one of the things that's really important about this group of maze biologists who mobilize is that, um, their vision of what was going to happen across the rest of the Americas with respect to maize cultivation was, was basically based on their understanding of what had happened with the introduction of hybrid corn varieties in the American Midwest. Um, and so they had in, you know, within the past decade in the, you know, between the 1930s and the 1940s, the, the corn belt of the United States went under this, underwent this mass transition from um, more or less land races of different kinds and a, and a pretty sizable diversity in, in terms of the kinds of corn that people were growing to an, an absolutely homogenized landscape, right? And so this was an extremely dramatic event that they had all just witnessed. And so the, the advent of development, agricultural development programs um, in uh, Latin America or in other parts of the world uh, really caused in, in this case, these maize biologists, but also uh, other agriculturalists from the United States and from Europe to sort of imagine agricultural transitions in other places based on this kind of events as they had unfolded uh, in their own home countries, right? So there was a real kind of projection of the American experience abroad that um, didn't quite pan out as uh, as they had imagined, but nonetheless motivated uh, this intense activity and subsequently then um, motivated activity around other crops and in other places as agricultural development and aid became a more significant part of um, basically post-World War II um, foreign aid programs and, and economic development programs. Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? The societies are hosting Seed Week from March 22nd through the 26th. Check out our show notes for a link to our Seed Week landing page where you'll find links to papers, K-12 activities, videos, news stories, and more. Or check out our Sustainable Secure Food blog for our seed-related blog series. Thanks again also to our sponsor, Campbell Scientific. Campbell Scientific is a world leader in digital sensors and systems. Their sensors provide accurate data to researchers, scientists, and governments. Their flagship VIEW products are state-of-the-art digital sensors that are compact, flexible, and draw low power. Featured VIEW products include the ClimaView 50 Complete Weather Sensor, the SoilView 10 Soil Moisture and Temperature Profile Sensor, and the RainView 10 Precipitation Sensor. Please visit them at www.campbellsci.com to learn more about these innovative digital sensors. Thank you for being our sponsor. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, so we kind of had this, like, uh, initial maybe grassroots uh, movement of, like, hey, we need to take care of these seeds and protect them because they might go away, uh, which then kind of evolved into this larger international uh, focus, maybe more collaborative across different countries um, to build some of these larger banks. And then uh, starting in, I believe you said around the 70s then, uh, we have our... our kind of current maybe uh phase that we're still working through today uh which really saw a big shift in some of the ideologies of how seed banks uh should be handled so can you tell me more about that stage as well yeah let me first tell you about the the real kind of 
international mobilization of, of seed banking. Um, and as I've just suggested, this, um, this vision of a wave of agricultural modernization, of transformation in how farmers went about cultivating crops uh, that would, you know, a, a wave of modernization that would encompass most most places in the world um, was something that uh, really came to be a, a kind of preoccupation in the 1960s and 70s. And one reason for that was precisely that some pretty dramatic agricultural shifts were happening. So you often hear people talk about the Green Revolution. Um, and sometimes people mean that in a very general way, like they mean agricultural modernization, so-called, or, or a sort of technological transformation. Um, but at the time that phrase was introduced, the Green Revolution referred to this shift in the kind of crops that, um, specifically the kind of wheat and rice, um, that farmers were growing in parts of Latin America, parts of Asia, uh, and the Middle East. And so it was a shift in crop varieties, uh, towards higher yielding types, um, that happened in, in a quite significant or kind of sudden uh, uh, moment over the span of a few years, uh, farmers in Mexico, farmers in India, um, potentially farmers in the Middle East as well, were growing wheat varieties, for example, based around uh, the same or, or um, similar initial strain, so that shared significant genetic material. And that really worried a lot of agronomists and breeders. So they suddenly, you know, they'd been worried about um, kind of regional, uh, regional circumstances in which a lot of farmers started growing the same things. Um, now they were really worried about globally, right? That globally there was going to be an, a kind of increased homogenization of crop varieties. Uh, and that in light of that, the urgency for developing conservation collections basically kind of skyrocketed. Um, so this became something that was discussed for example, at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. It was something that was discussed within an international uh, research uh, collaboration known as the International Biological Program. Uh, it became a subject of discussion at the, the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations, which were heavily invested in um, agricultural assistance at the time. Um, and finally, it came to be a subject that was placed on the kind of at the, the feet of a newly formed international organization in 1972, the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, um, or, or CGIAR, as they prefer to be referred to today. And so um, the, the, um, these concerned uh, international experts really demanded that the, the CGIAR, which was invested in agricultural modernization, um, that is to say, putting these, these, these new crop varieties, these new high yielding varieties out into the world, um, that, that it also become invested in conserving the same varieties that its agricultural um, aid and development schemes were eliminating. Uh, and that's really, that is, you know, the CG did go on from there to um, establish an international board for plant genetic resources, which then became the orchestrator of an international network of seed banks. Um, and so when I refer to the kind of system that we have today coming roughly online in that, that period of time, um, um, that's what I mean. They, the, the, Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research and its um, Board on Plant Genetic Resources connected up lots of different seed collections, national and um, some located with international agricultural research institutions, to make a kind of international network of collections, which would serve, at least as it would as it was initially imagined, as a you know kind of virtual international bank um, by virtue of the fact that you would be able to um, access any of its parts it was a kind of uh, international collection though disparate in location sure uh so that all sounds uh great uh i guess maybe on its surface but i know uh something that you wanted to talk about is kind of some of these um some of the like critiques or uh, difficulties that scientists have had in uh, maybe putting these ideals into practice, um, which kind of ties into maybe the current stage that we're in. Um, so can you tell me about maybe some of the history of 
kind of the 70s forward as well as kind of uh, some of the issues that they've been wrestling with on that path? So as almost as soon as this um, international system for managing what were that by then referred to as plant genetic resources, um, so seeds of diverse crop varieties, more or less, um, almost as soon as this was was put in place in in the 1970s and, and began to be developed quite um, kind of systematically into an international network of seed banks, uh, seeds became this matter of intense contestation um, um, in a number of different international forums. Um, so at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, uh, the group of 77, which were the non-aligned nations or the, the nations of the global south, we might say, um, uh, began arguing that this uh, this international network of seed banks was basically serving to <clears throat> basically serving to move seeds from uh, the the you know gene rich if you will countries of the global south to seed banks in wealthy countries where breeders would be using them to their own advantage or even worse they would be used by private industry and by the the early 1980s, um, private uh, seed uh, companies had the capacity to implement quite significant intellectual property protection. So they were able to control uh, the further dispersal of those seeds. Uh, so the argument went that the international seed banking system was moving seeds from global south to wealthy industrialized north. Uh, breeders at private companies were using those seeds to develop varieties that were then proprietary varieties, which could only be accessed by poor nations by purchasing them. So this was a, a systematic shift of, of transfer in, in, uh, in many accounts um, of, of crop diversity and uh, genetic material from, from poor farmers to, um, to you know, wealthy companies and wealthy countries. Uh, and that argument um, and the, the discussions and debates that it fostered, this competition over ownership of seed uh, and also safe stewardship and um, different kind of regulations on sharing of seed and germplasm uh, led to uh, entirely new <laughs> uh, tools and instruments being put in place um, to govern the, the sharing of seeds between seed banks. So the, the system of seed banking became um, actually quite a bit more, more complicated as uh, efforts to make it more, more just and ex, uh, equitable uh, unfolded. At the same time, I, I think there's an interesting kind of parallel development, not unrelated, uh, in which um, we might think of what I've just been talking about as the, the kind of formal seed sector, if you will. Uh, we might think of it as the the state-led seed conservation sector. Um, but at the same time that that, that uh, was in development and then um, kind of under contestation in the, in the late 1970s and early 80s, uh, you have a real growth in the grassroots seed saving movement, in local and community seed initiatives that really work to kind of form conservation efforts all on their own. Uh, and some of those organizations end up setting up kind of a a parallel seed banking system. They have their own freezer storage. They have their own regimes for growing out seed from season to season and so on. And so um, suddenly from the 1980s uh, onwards, the kind of landscape of uh, seed banking gets well, more heterogeneous in terms of the kinds of institutions that get involved in it, um, but then also much more complicated uh, in terms of the politics that um, seed conservation is thought to to embody and the interests that it's found to to serve uh yeah that uh gosh what a complicated system or multiple systems um so thank you for sinking so much of your time and research into really uh kind of sussing out a lot of those issues for us and i think that brings us pretty pretty readily to kind of the role of seed banks today um, not only in their ongoing uh, use for breeders and conservationists, but also kind of where we're headed with them, maybe future research or initiatives. 
Um, so what are your thoughts on kind of their role today and where we're going? Yeah, that's a great question. And in, in so many ways, it's hard to answer. It's, it's especially hard to answer for a historian um, because we're great at looking back over our shoulders and we're, we're not great at looking forward into the future. Um, one thing that I think is really important when looking at the, the long history of, um, of seed banking and the, the creation of these as kind of conservation centers or operations um, is really uh, kind of appreciating the, the limitations um, that come with um, banking diversity as the way of keeping it available. Um, it is uh, immediately obvious to anyone who wanders through the history of seed banking um, to see that uh, those who have uh, stewarded seed have always struggled to, to have the resources, to have the labor resources, the financial resources, um, the, the kind of continuous institutional support that's required uh, to keep these going. And so... Um, you, you know, if I, if you remember when I said the setting up of, of seed banks in, um, Mexico and Brazil and Colombia in the, in the 1950s to save endangered maize, well, within a few years of those being established, um, they were already struggling, uh, to, to keep up with, um, the, the requirements, um, of keeping maize alive and, um, sorry, keeping the seed alive, uh, over time. Um, you know, it's, 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 uh, was then and, and remains now a sort of a sort of thankless job and I think a lot of people who work in in seed banking and seed conservation would um, would agree to that 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 there aren't it's not given <laughs> for all the importance that it's recognized to have it's not given uh, necessarily the resources that um, the the researchers and scientists and, and technicians who carry it out really need to do it well and as a result there are often, kind of gaps in the, in the conservation system. It's, it's one reason that Svalbard was created is actually just because of a worry that the everyday work of seed banks was so often being neglected. Um, not even necessarily that there would be a, you know, a flood that would wipe one out or, or something as catastrophic as war. Um, it could just be that, you know, the freezer goes out of operation and there isn't a budget line to replace it, uh, in some places. Right. And so, I think this, you know, this continual worry and anxiety over decades and decades about the resources needed to maintain banks and the inability to convince governments um, about keeping them up suggests that they themselves, although they're our conservation bulwarks, are, are vulnerable institutions. Um, and so we might kind of, uh, you know, we, we might want for governments to invest in them uh, much more than they do, um, but we also might want to put um, additional resources too towards um, diversifying uh, the crops that that we grow, and I know that there are a lot of researchers who work with crop development um, and uh, crop diversity, uh, I should say, and its utilization that make this case as well, that um, it's not enough to just have crop diversity banked somewhere and to have a backup uh, in the Arctic, but we really need to be trying to move material back out of the banks um, much more uh, aggressively, and that this means often um, greater investment in public agricultural research, right? So getting funding to researchers who will do the hard work of working working with materials that aren't necessarily immediately amenable to breeding programs, um, um, but working with them so that they can be used and um, developed into crops that will keep agricultural productivity where we need it to be um, now and, and moving forward. Um, so I think that's, you know, thinking about the future of seed conservation is, is, um, in part thinking about, about diversifying it, um, thinking about conservation as something that can't end with a seed saved in a bank, but actually, uh, needs, uh, you know, crops and, and seeds to keep moving, uh, to keep evolving, keep developing, right? Conservation, uh, isn't over when the seed is saved. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I don't put a lot of thought into the future of seed banks in my day to day life, but I maybe should. because <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, yeah, this whole conversation has been so rich so far. So thank you for that. Um, but I've got three questions left for you. 
Uh, the first one is if people want to learn more about seed banks or seed conservation, um, its history or where we're at today, like what, where can they go? Well, one place, hopefully in a few months time will be to check out my book, Endangered Maze, Industrial Agriculture and the Crisis of Extinction, which despite the title is not, is not just about maize. That's the central case, but it really explores the history of seed banking in depth. Uh, for a really wonderful look at the early history of seed saving as juxtaposed to more recent efforts to collect crop diversity around the world, um, it's worth checking out a book by Courtney Fullalove called Prophet of the Earth. Um, and that's a really a wonderful and um, almost a kind of like tour guide uh, uh, or like travel um, travel log approach to thinking about both the history of seed saving um, and also its and also its present. Those sound great. We will uh, include a link to that second book in our show notes, and uh, please keep us posted on when your new one comes out. We'd be happy to share that around and add it to our show notes. Um, second question is if people want to get involved with seed banks, what can they do? Great question. Well, I think one of the most, um, interesting and exciting trends of recent, uh, maybe the recent, uh, recent decade or so is, uh, the growth in the number of local seed swaps and seed libraries. These have certainly been around since since um, maybe the 1970s in this kind of uh, f- community formalized way, but they've really expanded lately. So you might check and see whether there's a group of seed savers in your neighborhood uh, that or your your region where people um, are able to gather and and share the things that they're growing in their garden and and exchange expertise and knowledge. Um, I think it's not necessarily getting involved in seed banking, um, but it is uh, getting involved in seed saving in a way that I think is is important for for recognizing um, what work there is and what labor is involved in in keeping seed. For sure, that is great advice. And then final question is, what is one fun fact that people would not know about you if all they had was your research? That's probably the hardest question of all. Um, (laughs) I think uh, uh, an easy answer to that question is that my uh, favorite food is chocolate-covered pretzels. Ooh, good choice. (laughs) So good. Um, Well, great. Uh, Thank you so much for just such a rich conversation. Um, Clearly a subject that you are just an expert in. Uh, So thank you so much for sharing that expertise with us and being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. for listening to Field Lab Earth. You'll find links to today's resources in our show notes or on our website. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for show topics, please contact us at podcast at sciencesocieties.org or on Twitter at Field Lab Earth. If you'd like to hear more content like this, please subscribe and don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Stitcher, or anywhere else you find your podcasts if you like our show. We're also available on Lyceum, the world's first audio learning community, where you can join our discussion group and comment on each episode. This podcast is a joint production of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America. Special thanks to Lobo Loco for the use of their song Spook Castle on the intro and outro of our show. Opinions and conclusions expressed by guests are their own and are not considered as those of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, Soil Science Society of America, its staff, its members, or its advertisers. <laughs>